All right, I want to introduce you uh, to somebody. His name is John Henry Weston. He is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSiteNews.com and host of the John Henry Weston Show. John Henry, how are you, sir? Glenn, very good to speak with you. In fact, it's an honor for me as one of the original pioneers against cancel culture. Uh, You're a real hero. Ah, Wow, thank you very much. I wanted to talk to you about something that I don't think a lot of Americans know about. I think Catholics might, uh, but they uh, I don't know if they know what is happening and how important what is happening with the Pope, uh, I believe, this Friday. Can you take us through slowly and explain as you go along? Absolutely. So, as, as you've covered, actually, very often, we have seen a global revolution for over the last hundred years, but, but especially in the last hundred years. And very often, heaven is very helpful in warning us of what's going on. Now, one of the things that I want to do is I want to encourage your listeners not to trust what I'm saying, to go and verify for themselves, because they can do that nowadays. Mm-hmm. So in 1917, there was the most stupendous public miracle in the history of the world after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. It was in October of 1917, October 13th, in fact. And you can go and look at the newspaper's reports from all over Portugal. It happened in Coimbra, Port- in, in, uh, in the, at the Cova de area at the time in Portugal. And uh, you can go and look at all the newspaper reports. Three shepherd children poor as church mice, couldn't read, couldn't write, um, were receiving visions, actually, from heaven. Actually didn't know what they were seeing. First they saw an angel uh, in in the year before, and uh, teaching them to pray in reparation for sins being committed against our Lord, and all of the sins that we deal with normally. But in 1917, starting in May, they saw a woman from heaven. Uh, They later learned that it was the mother of Jesus, Who appeared to them? She asked the three little kids to show up on the 13th of the month for six consecutive months. So they started this, and the rumor started to spread. You know, no one saw anything except for the little kids, but they would hear these messages, and they were secrets to be held and so on. One of the first messages, one of the first visions that they saw was hell. It was opened up before them, and they saw many people falling into hell, and they knew it was for all eternity and how horrible that was. And they were told that this is hell where the souls of poor sinners go. So this is what happens. I mean, this is unbelievable stuff seen by little children, seven, eight, and ten years old at the time. And what happens is this gets more and more popular. You know, as things are, people are interested in the extraordinary, they, they think this is happening, but people are showing up first by the hundreds, then actually by the thousands. Um, but all they're seeing is three little kids kneeling down in a field, middle of nowhere, and they're just praying. But they're saying all sorts of extraordinary things. And rumors start and rumors start. So eventually, thousands of people start coming, so, so much so that the government at the time there, which was leaning communist against religion, hated the Catholic faith, wanted to do away with it. We're like, oh, we're disturbed. This is terrible. There's many people coming out to this nonsense. So in August, they forbid the three little kids, August 13th, they forbid them to going uh, to their normal appointment, if you will, at the COVID area with uh, the woman from heaven. And uh, they, they have to skip because they're, they're basically arrested, they're threatened. And then they go back and they're told that in October, there would be a miracle so that people could all believe what they're saying. And this is stupendous, because the government at the time, that again, hates the faith and wants to disprove it, has seen these thousands of people, in fact, by September, tens of thousands showing up for this thing, has decided, good, we'll let them show up in October, because we know that this is all BS, and we'll let these little kids make a fool of the Catholic Church, and we'll show everybody that this is all nonsense. And so the government doesn't restrict the crowds, but they also encourage the media of the time to mm. come. <laughs> so here it goes. And the media are ready 
to absolutely lambaste this and take it down as as they're wont to do. And yet what happened? So come noontime when it was supposed to happen, it's raining cats and dogs. Already people are calling out what a sham this is. I'm sure the writers and the photographers are going nuts with, <laughs> what a story this is going to be. It's really juicy. Here are these idiots standing out here in mud everywhere because it's in the middle of a field. And it's just disgusting. And then the little kids kneel down in the middle of this mud and disgust. And uh, Lucy, one of the three kids, yells, look at the sun. The sun begins to spin, gyrate on its axis, and then throw off various colors. And then it starts to dance in the sky, and then it comes hurtling toward the earth. So much so that people, now there's 70,000 people there, and there's reporters from everywhere photographing this. And you can see in the photos the rain, people all standing there in their umbrellas, and it was horrible, like a mud field. And then you, 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 what happens is the sun hurtles toward the earth. They think they're all going to die. People start kneeling down in the mud, screaming out their sins, saying, you know, repent, I repent, I repent, because they honestly think it's the end of the world. And then all of a sudden, just as fast as it started, and this, by the way, it only takes less than a minute. Everything goes back to normal. The sun goes back to where it belongs. Everything is back to normal, except one thing is weird. Everything is dry, like there was no rain. So it's a stupendous miracle witnessed by 70,000 people and photographed. And I would encourage your readers, to, your, your listeners, to go and check it out. Check out the newspaper articles. They're all over the net because it was so stupendous. But this was heaven's warning in 1917 about what was to come. So I want to read for you the exact words of the woman from heaven, Our Lady, as Catholics call her, or the Mother of Jesus, as she would be known popularly. She said, and this is the account from the three little kids, the the oldest of whom was kept alive. Actually, Sister Lucy uh, joined a convent later and lived in Quamber, Portugal, uh, in the convent. Her little cousins, Jacinta and Francisco, both died at the time, Um, and they died of plague, and and they suffered actually horrible deaths, but they offered up all of their sufferings in union with Jesus' own suffering on the the cross to expiate or to to repair, if you will, to console our Lord uh, for these outrages of the sins of mankind. Okay, so wait, John Henry, before we go on, let me take a one-minute break, because I don't want to interrupt once we once we get into uh what was said because this is a prophecy of nuclear war and really kind of a warning to the popes do this or annihilation will come to many countries on earth and this is what pope francis now is doing no other pope has done this john paul did a little bit but it, it, it wasn't according, to, apparently, and not according to exactly what the, the last secret is, that only popes know what that last secret is, we can guess. We'll have more in just a second. So uh, we're back with John Henry Weston. He is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSiteNews.com. John Henry, <clears throat> there are three secrets that, they were, that the kids were given, um, and all the first two, I believe, have been revealed, and then the third one is the prophecy of nuclear war, or, or is that another? So, is that the second so, one? Yeah, it's a little bit complicated because of the way it's it's worded. So, the first secret would have been the vision uh, of hell that we already described. Okay. The next or second secret is what I'm about to read to you exactly what the explanation of that vision was. The third secret, if you will, is uh, another vision that they receive, and then there's a missing part, because notice how with the first secret, or first was a vision, and then came part two, explanation. Part three is another vision, except there's no explanation this time. Okay. And that is what is thought to be the missing component, and we'll get into that. Okay. So... These are the words directly from Our Lady, the Mother of Jesus, from heaven to the children. 
She said, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And that is the, you know, devotion to the heart of Mary, which beats for the love of Jesus. So, um, if what I say to you is done, she continued, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end. Now, this is the First, first world, world War. This is in 1917. So the war is going to end. But if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the reign of Pius XI. Now, that's very interesting because, of course, there is no Pius XI at the time. This is 1917, so they don't even have a Pius XI. And then she's obviously then predicting the Second World War. She says, and she goes on, to prevent this, I shall come to ask for consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. She says, and this is where the prophecies of doom come in. If my request are heeded. Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions against the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father, that means the Pope, will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. Mm. Okay. Then adds at the end, In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a certain period of peace will be granted to the world. Okay, so who was the Pope during, first question, who was the Pope during World War II? The Pius XII is the uh, Pope from, uh, I think it was 42, and very interestingly, he tries to do this. Now, in answer to Heaven's request, there have been a number of popes who tried. A lot of them didn't bother. Not, not a lot. There's only, we're only talking about, I believe, there's eight popes. But Pius XII tries. He could see the build-up, and in, in October 42 already, he does a consecration, but he doesn't do it exactly the way Our Lady requested. If you notice in the request, and... She said, I will come back to ask. When she comes back, it's, it's actually 1929. And I can read for you the request. She says, this is 1929, so now the first two children have died. Uh, Sister Lucy is in the convent, and our Lord appears to her and says, The moment has come when God asks the Holy Father to make in union with all the bishops of the world the consecration of Russia. Uh, this is Our Lady, I'm sorry. The consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart promising to save it by this means. Now, the key words are, the moment has come when God has asked for the Holy Father, that's Pope, to make, in union with all the bishops of the world, the consecration of Russia, to my Immaculate Heart. So here's the interesting part. So 1942, you have Pope Pius XII try it in, 19, in October 1st. So he tries it. He does a consecration, yes, of the world, not of Russia, and he doesn't invite the other bishops. Sister Lucy already starts to write, wait a minute, didn't work because he didn't do it exactly as was asked for. He tries it again in December, same thing, not involving all the other bishops, not mentioning Russia. In, in 52, in July of 52, he actually does mention Russia, but doesn't do it with all the other bishops. And so, you know, there's tries, but again, it's not done exactly. Now, to, to give an example of how severe it is to not do it exactly... I point you to recent articles. If you go to LifeSightNews.com and check these articles out, recently there were a couple of priests who were watching videos of their own baptism. And in the baptism, the priest baptizing these little children, who are later priests, says, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. Right, right, right. And yet, it's invalid. Why? Because the words that Jesus taught for baptism that are used throughout the Scriptures are absolutely to be used and if they're not used properly, Correct. the baptism's invalid. It's supposed to be, I baptize you. Okay, so... But think of how small that is. So the wording is so super important. So let me take another break, and I'm going to come back. And now I want to ask you, what is the Pope doing? And is it because of, as you wrote in one of your articles, um, th- this, this 
plays a role somehow or another uh, with Ukraine, Kiev, and uh, Russia. Something about that, we think. And the Pope all of a sudden has said, hey, we have to do this. What is he doing and is he going to do it right? Um, and we'll, we'll continue our conversation here in uh, just a second. You can read all of these stories on LifeSiteNews.com, LifeSiteNews.com. I know we have a lot of uh, Christians that listen to the program, a lot of people that are, are not Catholic. I'm not Catholic, um, but I think any time, I do believe that God knows what's going on. We should put our faith in God and not in man. Uh, and any faith that is trying to appeal to heaven, we should uh, be aware of and pray for ourselves as well. Back in just a minute. The Pope is doing something beginning this uh, weekend, this Friday. Um, he is fulfilling something that was started in 1917, if he completes it correctly. Uh, John Henry Weston is with us. He's the co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSiteNews.com. We've been talking about uh, Fatima. If you're Catholic, you know what that means. But it was something that happened uh, in this little town in Portugal uh, with uh, three little kids. Um, and uh, Our Lady of Fatima had invited uh, the, uh, the Pope and the, all of the bishops to consecrate um, uh, Russia to the heart of the uh, uh, Immaculate Heart. Now, here is the here's the thing that I have so far, John Henry, Lucy, the main girl who survived. Um, she she was given um, prophecy at the time, so she predicted correctly, or you know, given the information about World War II in 1917. I have read that she is, I mean, these are poor little kids in a know-nothing town. She didn't even know what the word Russia meant at the time. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and then she also says that various nations, if this doesn't happen with Russia, various nations will be annihilated. Then in 1957, when it's still not done, she says, Holy Father, you got to please do this because many nations will disappear from the face of the earth. Exactly. Okay, so now several popes have tried it, but what brought this pope, and I don't mean to be offensive, but I, this pope doesn't seem like real Catholic Catholic pope, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, what has brought this pope to, to do this? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, because this pope, uh, you, there's two things. For one, we have the perfect setup, like never before. So you have... Russia attacking Ukraine, Ukraine under fire, and its bishops, the bishops of Ukraine who are under attack from Russia, begging the Pope, please consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart as Our Lady of Fatima requested. So that's huge all by itself. So very much there is now a, a pressure on the Pope and the world's bishops to do this like there never, ever has been before. In addition, this is very strange. Well, you might say if Francis, for instance, is all about, hey, I want to do something unique, hey, no pope's done this for the last hundred years. They've been asked to, but nobody has. I can do this. This is really simple because it is really simple. It's like for kids could understand it. All you have to do is get together with all the other bishops and do this consecration, mentioning Russia specifically. So let's just do it. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But he's also got chutzpah. This is the pope who fired Cardinal Burke, who just dismantled so much of the church. So he's got a chutzpah that we haven't seen in the papacy probably mm. ever. Maybe, maybe during the medieval times. So let's say he does this. A lot of people are hoping it'll bring about not only the Russia's conversion, but the Pope's conversion, too. And then he can turn his chutzpah on uh, all the other stuff in the church. Okay, so uh, try not to hide your feelings. Um, the, uh, uh, there's also, though, isn't there another prophecy that talks about when the Pope travels to Russia, if he hasn't done this, I think, travels to Russia and meets with uh russia that that's a bad thing is that so yeah there are all sorts of prophecies about russia being the instrument of chastisement of the world in fact our lady mentions uh, mentioned to the kids that this would happen about about the many nations would be removed from the face of the earth if 
the conversion of Russia had not been obtained beforehand. And this is our big issue. Um, the, the Russia is obviously right now <laughs> doing massive harm to Ukraine. They've also threatened nuclear war. So we're back not only in the Cold War days, we're actually really on the cusp. This is a real possibility, although many people are sort of asleep to it. There's also another weird thing. In 33, Jesus appears to Sister Lucy and says, hey, they haven't done it yet. So this is only four years into when the request was made in 29. And they're following the footsteps of the King of France. The reason why that's interesting is because there was a hundred year span between a request for the King of France to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Wasn't done for a hundred years. A hundred years to the day after that request was made and unfulfilled by the kings of France, the kings of France were removed. Um, they weren't killed yet, but they were removed, they were deposed, and then later killed. And our Lord said to Sister Lucy in 1933, they're following in the footsteps of the king of France, and they will suffer the same misfortune. So that 100-year timeline is very important, because it's coming up. 1929 is the 100-year timeline, the end of the 100-year timeline. So there's a, there's a time component to this that speaks to this as well. So whatever Francis is doing it for, saying that he's going to do it for, is interesting. However, just on Sunday, Francis alarmed all of those who keep up with Fatima very clearly, very much, because he then talked about consecrating all of humanity mm. and, and Russia, Ukraine. And so a bunch of experts in Fatima, in fact, coming out today is an interview I have with John Salva, who's written a numerous books on this. There's real alarm, because getting this wrong at this point could hasten or, or bring so about what, the other. What is the, I mean, honestly, even if you don't believe it, okay, let's say I'm magically the Pope, and I'm like, okay, so what did she say? All right, write it down. I would just be like, we're doing it word for word, and then yeah. I'll do something else. You know, then I want to, yeah. you know, then I want to take everybody out for milkshakes or whatever it is. But you exactly. would do that correctly. Yep. Yep. And that's been the debate for the last hundred years. Because political reasons and whatever else and inconvenience or whatever place. What could that, possibly what? be the political reason or the inconvenience? In yeah. This? So the political reason was exacerbating the already tension between the Orthodox and the Catholics in Russia, perhaps leading to persecution. And so all these things are there. But one interesting part I want to get to before we close is that, remember, that second part of the secret, uh, the, the third secret, and then there's no explanation. Well, the third secret was about death and destruction. You basically, you have the Pope there, and he's stepping over bodies in Rome of all sorts of religious and laity and people, and then he goes up a mountain, and he's there praying with other priests and so on, he gets shot and killed. And so that secret wasn't revealed until 1960, excuse me, was supposed to be revealed in 1960, wasn't until 2000. But there's a missing part, the explanation, as I said in the beginning, uh, the explanation of that. Well, interestingly, other visions that were related to Fatima, because they would never release that, were from Akita. And they are alarming because they speak again about the same thing. October 13, 1973, if your people want to look it up, Akita, Japan, Our Lady appears to a nun by the name of Agnes Sasagawa, and she says, relating it to Fatima, as I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father, that means God the Father, will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, that means the flood, such as one uh, will never have been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. So that kind this of is the kind of thing we're looking uh, to avoid and perhaps asking for if we don't get this right. Okay, real quick, I've got about 90 seconds max. Tell me what Catholics should do. To Should they call their bishop? or They should indeed call their bishops and ask them to consecrate Russia in union with the Pope to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But the most important role for laity is what she asked us, because heaven had a request not only to the Pope and bishops, but also for all Catholics and all faithful around yeah. the world, and that is to make the first Saturday devotions, to pray the Holy Rosary, to and which is a beautiful prayer. You can look it up on my site. It's all, you, you'll find all the info there. It's a meditation on the life of Christ with the prayers. Yeah. But it is the five first Saturday devotion, meditation, 
receiving communion, going to confession, confessing your sins, and meditating on the life of Christ, the mysteries of the rosary, uh, for 15 minutes on the first Saturday of each month for five consecutive months. Really simple stuff. Most people have never done it. We have a role to play, and this is it. It's all about making reparation to the sins committed against Jesus and His Holy Mother, because it is you, you see what we're doing. You cover every day what we're doing in terms of sin in this world. And we need to repent for it, because God is a just God, as well as a merciful God, but His cup of mercy is running out, because we have just expended it. Uh, I will tell you, I I grew up Catholic, and I used to go to church all by myself on Saturdays. I was a weird little kid, but I uh, prayed the rosary almost every Saturday for a long time. And it is really, truly, when you do it right, and you're meditating on the life of Christ, it is a very, very uh, fulfilling thing to do. So I urge you, if you're Catholic, I might just join you. I urge you, if you're Catholic, uh, to do that for the next uh, four weeks. John Henry, thank you so much. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be with you. Please do say that rosary with us, and I will pray one for you especially. Thank you. God God bless. bless. 